Good morning. We've looked at some interesting comparisons in 1 John. It started out with light and darkness. Actually, it comes through the whole book, the whole letter. And um, we talked about love and hate. Uh, we're now going to talk about truth and error. He, he, he keeps putting things in juxtaposition so that, so that we can weigh them out. It's always a good idea to know what's right and to be aware of the fact of what's wrong. Um, we don't walk around in total innocence. And, and, and there is a difference. There's a difference between light and dark and love and hate and truth and error. Dr. Wearsby calls this section of the book Truths or Consequences. Not bad. Truth or Consequences. I have four points in my outline this morning. You may think we never get to them. Actually, the first part of the message doesn't deal with the four points. I'll let you know when they come up. This is the kind of, this is the kind of study today that needs a glossary. And, and, and glossaries usually come at the back of the book. And yet the thumb back, not this one, I'm going to give them to them at the beginning. Actually, they come at the end of the scripture reading. Because there's some, there's some theology, there's some doctrine, there's some terms here that we'd better come to grips with, and then we'll look at the text. The outline has to do with the text. So I'll let you know. The first term in the glossary, phrase actually, the last time or the last hour, you, uh, your version does say the last hour. Or last time. And hour is what it is in the Greek. And by the way, it's interesting to know that, that hour in Greek is ora, as it also is in Spanish. I don't know where they got the how they did that, but they did it. All right, it's the last hour. And one of the problems with phrases like this is that it occurs in slightly different variation here and there and over here. And in different contexts, there is a reference in the Old Testament to the fact that the last times, the last hours, are Israel's great kingdom expectations. There's a little switch on it when it says the latter hour or the latter times happen to refer to the times just before Israel's last times. And so... One of them focuses on all this going to happen in the day of the Lord, the terrible consequences of tribulation, and yet the glory times of Israel. But one of the smaller little points there, that latter thing, says this is what's going to happen right before the tribulation. Well, I don't want to mix that up with the church. But there is a last hour, last times, for the church. And the truth of the matter is, they began when the church began. And they won't end until the rapture. And so, in a sense, that phrase is more a description of a condition than it is of a number of weeks or months or years, a time frame. The, the, the sound of it is, the last times, the last hour, oh, well, we're talking about from June until... No, 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 no. It's more a description of the class of the time, the, the description of the character of the time. And what was it like? And it was a period of time, last days for the church, is a period of time of denials. Let me read a portion to you from from uh, second. Timothy chapter 3. Uh, know this. In the last days, perilous times will come. 
Men will be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those who are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God. It leaves you breathless. I mean, the list, and it's not done. Having a form of godliness, denying the power. All of these things are describing the last days of the church. <laughs> but John tells us they began in his day. No wonder they call this an evil age. Oh, it's the age of grace. Yeah. But the last days of the church, this the characteristic of those days is the characteristic of people denying this, denying that, denying that. And John says in the letter that we're reading, they deny the Lord Jesus Christ. They deny that He's God. They deny that He came in the flesh. Characteristics. All right, second thing we need to look at in the glossary. Antichrist. Now, when anybody says that, Outside of the context of a Bible study on 1 John, what they're thinking of is somebody down the road, way down the road. Some individual who rises up and becomes, capital A, Antichrist. And that's because in the, in the book of Revelation, you do find someone whom we have been wont to describe as Antichrist. The word doesn't appear in Revelation. It only appears in 1 John. The word Antichrist does not appear in Revelation. Now, there are descriptions that appear in Revelation that make us understand how this word is applied. Now, remember, anti can be Two, one of two things. Well, it can be either one of two things. It can be against or it can be instead of. That's the meaning of this word anti in the language from which it comes. Against or instead of. Now, the pseudo-Christs, about which Matthew 24 speaks, the false Christ, pseudo-Christs, they're the ones who firmly believe every, certain things that are said about Christ, but they come and blasphemously pretend that they are that Christ. The antichrists deny that Christ is what He says He is. Now, let me put it again. These two words uh, illustrate differences in what anti can mean. The Antichrist of John is the one who opposes Christ and denies that he came as the Son of God and lies about it, of course. But the pseudo-Christ, Matthew 24, that's the one who comes and says, oh, well, yeah, I believe in Christ, sure, everything is true, and I'm He. Here I am. They pretend to be. Now, we've got all those things now. Uh, the Moonies. Well, I don't want to get into that right now. I'll do that a little bit later. Well, we have it all. We have it all. But John is dealing specifically with anti, meaning opposed to. Not those who, not John in this passage is dealing with those who, who say he didn't come in the flesh. He, he's this, he, that. He is not here dealing with the Antichrist of the future who, if there is one who gets the name, it will be the beast who comes from the sea and sets up a kingdom just as Christ was going to set it up. And he's, and, and he is implying he's taking the place of that Christ. It, it is perfectly possible that John, through all of this, is not saying, I want to focus at, uh, even a little bit on that future one. 
he is rather focusing on the fact that the spirit of Antichrist has always been with us. Always been with us. There has always been opposition, and there has always been though there have always been those who have, would say, "I'm he. Look at me. Follow me." You need a glossary, and you need to look into those things. All right, there's another thing in the glossary here that we have to look at, and that's um, the anointing. The anointing. This passage deals with it. There are twice, two times in the in the passage where he deals with the phrase, the anointing. And um, an, 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 anointing is a, sounds like a kind of a messy thing, you know that? Uh, when, when they say they poured oil on Aaron and it ran down into his beard, uh, I know that that was an Old Testament thing. It was a matter of setting him apart and the anointing was important. And, they, and it, was, it was probably some very special oil. The word, the word here, anointing, means something you rub on. An anointment. But in the Old Testament, there was that oil that poured and ran down. Uh -huh. Here, the anointing is that of the Holy Spirit. Not a second work of grace, but the, 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 the act of our Lord Jesus being put into Christ by the Holy Spirit, in, in, in which then He becomes resident. The Spirit becomes resident. It's called the indwelling. This anointing is not something you pray for. It's not something you search for. It's not some special um, heartwarming experience in which you get palpitations. You know? This is that moment when the Spirit of God places us in Christ, when we take Jesus Christ as our personal Savior, and the Holy Spirit comes to live within us. The Bible says in Romans that if He doesn't live within you, you're not one of His. It is so universal. You take Jesus Christ as personal Savior, the Holy Spirit comes in. And it's important because that's the only way you could have life that pleases Him. The Spirit comes in. Okay, this anointing, these people, by the way, the Corinthians had it. And they were a pretty low bunch. It is in the Corinthian letters that he says, Don't you know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit? These sinning Christians. Because sin does not take the Holy Spirit. You've got to remember in this glossary dealing with this fact that this Holy, the Holy Spirit's ministry is different in different ages. David had to pray, don't take your spirit from me. Having acknowledged his sin, don't take it from me. In the age of the church, which is called the age of the Holy Spirit as well, when the Spirit indwells us, sin does not take him out. It grieves him, but it does take him out. We have him. And so, so he can tell these readers, this John tells these readers, you have it. You have this unction. That's one of the words that's sometimes used. You, you, you have this, you have this, uh, this, this uh, um, very, very, very special baptism, so to speak. You have the presence of the indwelling Holy Spirit. And you know things because of that. What do you mean? Well, you know things because He's the teacher. That's what He promised them. So the indwelling Holy Spirit is necessary for life. It's necessary for knowledge for coming to know things, and you've got it. Now, there's one more in the glossary. Uh, the, I'm going to describe them as the went out from us group. The went out from us group. Divisions are not happy things. We know that here. Not happy things. Down through history, they've not all been bad. 
They've not all been bad. They have served to to define doctrine. Oh, they, they have served to remove um, mad elements. By the way, the same word that's used here, they went out, is the word they used to describe Judas leaving the upper room. It's a very simple word. The, the, the word here is not apostate, but the condition is apostate. The word is they went out. It's a simple word. They left. And here we need to, we need to recognize that that there is such a thing as apostasy. There is such a thing as a stepping away from. Uh, There is such a thing as denial. There is such a thing as a Christian, a believer, who lives carnally. To be carnally minded is death, says Paul, but there is such a thing as a believer who lives like the natural man. There's no telling what he'll do. There is no limit to what he'll do. To live like the natural man, to live as an... The flesh is capable of all those things. I don't think we're dealing with that here. I think we're dealing here with a person who steps away. Not unlike the seed that was sown in the parables of our Lord. And this, and it says that in Luke chapter 9, it says the devil came along and removed that seed. Um, and it didn't grow. It didn't produce. There are people who leave because they can't stand what God says in His Word. There are people who leave. There are people who leave. Uh, and, and let's go specifically to this path. The people who left here, they are not of us. They do not belong. They were uncomfortable with the apostolic teaching. Apostolic teaching. I believe the us here is really the same us as in the beginning. Those witnesses. And they left. They couldn't stand them. Naturally, if the heart is not tuned to the Scripture, well, to what God says, you aren't going to be comfortable with God's people. Okay. Now, let's go to the outline. <clears throat> That's the introduction. The outline, please. First point. The way things are. The way things are. It's the last time, little children. I like it. Remember, this is not that super warm, affectionate uh, one. It is not without affection. But, but this one here, this word here refers to the fact of, of, of schooling and learning, the, 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 the child in training. And it's almost as though he were saying here, okay, students, okay, students, it's the last time. And as you've heard, Antichrist will come and he's now here. There are many Antichrists. And that's how you know it's the last time. There are currently many People will pose. That's that's the way it is. So that's the first point in the outline, the way things are. They're not good. They're bad. This is an evil age in which we live. All right? Some, the second point, the way some have gone. The way it is, is the first point. The way some have gone... They went out from us, but they were not of us. For had they been of us, they would no doubt have continued. But they went out. And that departure is a defection. And the specifics of the defection are in 22 and 23. Who is a liar but he that denies that Jesus is the Christ? He's anti- he is... Antichrist that denies the Father and the Son. Whoever denies the Son, the same doesn't have the Father. But he that acknowledges the Son has the Father also. Denials. Note the question. Who is... Well, I can't remember what, the ver, what your version has there. But the question is... Uh, who is a liar, the way it's verse, in my version, actually 
there's an article there. Who is the liar? Does the NASV have that? The article is there. It's there in the Greek. Who is the li- the archetype ri- liar? The classic liar. The one that's just like Satan. Eh? The father of lies. Who is this classic archetype liar? (laughs) I don't think liar is the favorite word of John. But it sure keeps coming up. His favorite word would have been light and life and love. and, And he uses them over and over again. But liar keeps coming up. You know, it used to be, that was a word we didn't use in polite society. And that's what my mother told me. As a matter of fact, my mother threatened me, threatened to wash my mouth out with soap, if I use that word. And her concept of soap was Fels naphtha. Yes, there was always Fels naphtha in our home, and only you older folk are going to remember that one. I don't think it's on the market any longer, but it's, it's, a, it's a tan bar of strong stuff. I didn't use the word. A liar is one who's guilty of an untrue statement with an intent to deceive. Intent to deceive. And, and who is the liar? The one who denies it. But listen. That which we have seen and heard declare we unto you that you may have fellowship with us. And truly our fellowship is with the Father and with Jesus His Son, Jesus Christ. His Son, Jesus Christ. John has already said that. And the Antichrists are saying, John's a liar. I'm not a liar. John's a liar. And that verse calls to mind, and many other signs truly did Jesus in the presence of His disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. And the Antichrist said, John is a liar. And in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him. Without Him was not anything made that was made in Him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory, the glories of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. John, you're a liar, said the Antichrists. And Paul said, in, first, in Colossians chapter 1, he wrote words that they are absolutely majestic. Who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature, for by Him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by Him and for Him and is before all things, and all, by Him all things consist." And he's the head of the body of the church, who's the beginning, the firstborn from the dead. And it pleased the Father that in him should all fullness dwell. Paul, you're a liar too, say the Antichrists. They say of truth, it's error. They're not alone. The mind science groups say Jesus is merely a man who discovered a divine ideal. Those who come often to our doors and call themselves witnesses. He's Michael, the archangel, the first being created by God. He's already returned because he only rose from the dead spiritually. The Moonies. Declare that Jesus was a man who failed. The cross represents his failure. To the Mormons, Jesus is the spirit brother of Satan. In Freemasonry, Jesus was mystical and exemplary, but not divine. And it goes on and on and on. And the interesting thing is so many of these people who founded sects out there, S-C-C-T-S, were often at one time associated with Bible, church, but they went out from us. All right. Now, the way the believer is supposed to live, that's my third one. Have the way things are. 
And the way, who, the way some people went. Now, the way the believer is supposed to live, you have that unction, that anointing. And you know. There are facts. There's information that has been communicated to us because the Spirit of God is a great teacher. That's what he's telling these people. You've got something. Something special. 23. Well, 21, 21, I have not, no, I have not written to you, excuse me, because you no, don't know the truth, but because you know it. Good, all right? That's good. Now, 24. Let that therefore abide in you what you've heard. Here's the list of what, what, what happens here. He has the Holy Spirit. He knows the truth. And he abides in that truth. Stay where you are. That's what he's telling them. Stay where you are. Stay with that sound doctrine. Stand on it. Live by it. Live with it. Let it live through you. Abide. Where do you live? Where do you live? Stay with the truth. Stay with what you've learned. Abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, no more can you except you abide in me. How do you do that? If you, abide in my, if you keep my commandments, you shall abide. In my love. And the final point, and I'm through. The way John sees it. The way John sees it. That's first, right down there, toward the end. This is the promise that he's promised us, even eternal life. And these things I've written to you concerning them. My version says, who seduce you, who lead you down that primrose path. I want you to be prepared, he said. There are certain sure things. You have the Holy Spirit. You have been anointed. Once and for all, it's present. And you know certain things because he's taught you. Stay there. A major part of godliness lies in dogged attentiveness to familiar truth. Not the exotic. Not the next conference. Not that marvelous book. Dogged attention to things we already know. God has given us everything we need to live that kind of life. Father, I thank you. I thank you for the warning that comes here. Some of those things are patently obvious. We, we, we see them. But John is warning us. And he said right from that year 94 or 95 after Christ, this is the way it is right now because the spirit of Antichrist is around and the allurement to religion and society and arts and all of these things controlled by a philosophy of Antichrist is right there. Stay the course. Stand where you are and what you know from the Word of God. In Jesus' name we pray that this will be our testimony. Amen.